Hosting provided by Host Tornado. They offer website hosting packages, dedicated servers, and VPS solutions. HostT.net. Programming Throwdown, episode 31, Unix Commands. Take it away, Jason. Hey, so I had a absolutely terrifying moment um, over the Christmas holidays. I, uh, <clears throat> I moved a bunch of pictures from my camera to um, a USB drive that was connected to the router. And I didn't realize until now, I didn't quite think about it, but, you know, like the, the USB drive had a journaling file system. I think it was NTFS. And so, you know, the way journaling file system works is the driver kind of like says, I forget the term for it, but it like writes things to kind of like some cache and then at some point decides to sort of flush the cache and write it, write, actually write it to disk, you know. And, you know, being totally incompetent, like any, you know, person who works on a mo- modem, like if you ever have like a router, like a wireless router, it's always terrible. Like I bought tons of them, they always, they're always terrible. So I trusted my file system to these people, which is a huge mistake. And uh, the router, like, just, we lost power a couple of days later. I mean, this is literally days later. And uh, the photos were just gone. And it was all the photos I'd taken of the baby, mm. like, for the first six months, you know? So wait, why did you hook it into the router in the first place? Presumably you were going to copy it off? No, well, you know, I, I just thought that, like, I actually have a NAS, but the thing is, is... The NAS is a little slow to, to access, especially if, like, like uh, my wife, she likes to look at a bunch of pictures at the same time. And so I figured if it was on the modem, it'd be one less hop. When really, like, it didn't really matter because mm-hmm. the NAS is plugged straight in the modem. It's kind of <laughs> silly. But, you know, I used, at the time, you don't expect there to be this issue, right? So at any rate, um, so I was really freaking out. And then, you know, her computer, uh, I tried to, like, recover... Um, you know, the files off her computer. But uh, so just a quick heads up for people out there in the audience who, who didn't know this. I actually didn't know this for a really long time. I only learned it rather recently. But when you erase something, um, you know, there's just a journal on the file system that says, hey, you know, this file doesn't exist anymore. Like this index doesn't exist anymore. But on the physical disk, you know, there's still electrons and they still have for the most part, the same kind of charge that they did, you know, when the no, file No, electrons existed. always have the same charge. Uh, what was that? The electrons always have the same charge. Uh, well, so... No, well, I'm, 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 no I'm, just, I'm just giving okay. you a hard time. <laughs> no, yeah, so, well, you know what I mean. So you mean the flash, the flash, the, uh, the bits of the, flash are so, still flashed the same way, but it's just the header that says there's a file here has been erased or yeah, been exactly. deleted. But then what yeah. happened was... Uh, my wife's computer, which is what we put the pictures on before moving them to the USB drive, um, it defragged. It did a defrag, like a full defrag, which it does like every day. And so now like all of that electricity has been moved to a different location <laughs> and I couldn't recover anything. But then uh, we were actually able to recover the files off of the camera's SD card because, you know, that, you know, th- we don't do any defrag or anything on that. So it was pretty scary, but at least I got all the files. Um, I set up like a cloud account since then, everything. So I have everything backed up in the cloud and I have them okay, on the NAS, good. So, but, but wait, uh, so you should have been able to just run like a file recovery program on the USB drive and gotten your pictures back as well. No, so I tried, but uh, for whatever reason, it didn't work. Yeah, the USB drive just like, I don't quite know what happened there. But yeah, okay. I tried that. That was the first thing I tried, <laughs> and uh, they wouldn't recover. Yeah. Okay. I, I would throw away your router, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah, or just router. never never plug never so plug. Bad. Don't plug things you don't want to lose into it. Yeah. You know why is it that no one can make a good router? It just seems it's like really every hard. No, no, it's terrible. really hard. I mean, it's it's like a high performance device that's supposed to be really cheap, and do like a lot of things, right? Like it needs to have. Like a, a wireless router, at least it needs to do both. Be like a good LAN router, you know, like switch router yeah. thing, whatever. I'm I'm terrible with networking stuff, but the physical, yeah, you know, port switching. But then it also needs to do that for all the Wi-Fi connections, and you know, have good RF design to have good Wi-Fi reception. 
and transmission. I mean, it's like a lot of different things to go on. And on top of the fact that like, I think a lot of the stuff we were using, like the wireless, you know, 802.11, B and G, and even N are what, over 10 years old. And 10 right. years ago, we didn't, like in my house, there's probably 20 or more devices on the Wi-Fi at a given time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When, yeah. you know, when they were designed, people probably had one or maybe two computers that had Wi-Fi, you know, modems on them or whatever. Yeah, they have that new, like that 5G 802 AC or something like that. I don't know anything about networking either, but supposedly they have a new one that just came out, which is way better. But, you know, of course, then it's like, you know, your device, the, the endpoint also has to support it, right? Like whatever phone you have or whatever. Right. Yeah, your phone has to have it. Yeah, yeah. Same thing like uh, 5 gigahertz even is that, so 2.4 gigahertz is really crowded with like a lot of devices, a lot, of, like, you know, from my house, I can see 10 or 15 different, you know, Wi-Fi routers from everybody, all the neighbors. Yeah. So the, the the space is really congested, which causes speed problems. And um, so five gigahertz is less crowded and I believe there's more channels. So it's, it's a little bit better, but five gigahertz doesn't have as good of a range as 2.4 gigahertz and it's still tons of stuff doesn't support five gigahertz. So y- you can buy new products today that still don't have five gigahertz support in them. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, so. this might be the thing where like, we're just a couple of generations away from them getting this right. You know, it's like, this can't be that hard. It's like the mouse. You know, I feel like, you know, they got the mouse right, and then there hasn't been that many changes to it. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, I think there was supposed to be when they went, all the TV stations went digital from analog, that space was supposed to get freed up for this kind of thing to be able to be done um, in, in that the old where TV stations used to live in the RF spectrum. But uh, I think through various whatever the auctions and legislation got changed and so it didn't end up being a very uh good idea for companies to do that so it went to the same people that already do like the cell phone spectrum basically so it didn't oh, really I make see. a big change so. gotcha all right well, on all right to on to the news news so the first one here it's maybe more of a that's interesting slash discussion, but somebody built a 32 node Raspberry Pi supercomputer cluster. And I think somebody has done this before. I, I'm sure we've even maybe had one of these in a previous programming throwdown um, where somebody did this. Yeah, um, but I it remember got like, this. It got like a lot of, this one, you know, got press or whatever. Somebody was trying to run, uh, they were actually doing distributed sensor nodes. And this one had a um, interesting caveat where they did a good job of actually saying like, you know, this is kind of impractical for most things. Like a supercomputer is something different or way better, or even just running on, you know, a couple high performance computers might do a better job than putting all these Raspberry Pis. But um, the the person specifically was using some like uh, extra sensor and uh, radio communications things. And they were using the general purpose IO ports on the Raspberry Pi to interface to those things. So by having this cluster of them that way. He was able to simulate a sensor node better, or at least that's the gist I got from the article. And so I thought that was an interesting subject um, and kind of one of those things where I, I guess he said he spent about $2,000 building it, um, yeah, which is right. far cheaper than you know most things. So if it's the right tool for the right job, you know, I've seen people kind of spend more than, like even like I was like, oh, I get a Raspberry Pi to play around with, but then you forget, like you need the Raspberry Pi and an SD card and a, you know, Wi-Fi USB thing if you're gonna use one. Um, you know, and you like add up all the things, it's like, oh, man, this is actually kind of like gonna be like $100 and what am I really gonna do with it? Hmm, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's the issue I ran into. I was on the order like queue for one, but when my turn came to buy one, I just realized that, yeah, I didn't have any good ideas. Yeah, so, like, if you knew, like, oh, I'm going to use it to do this, like, it would, you know, it makes sense. Anyways, right tool for the right job, but, yeah, Raspberry Pi supercomputer. These Raspberry Pis, I thought they would just, like, kind of be a flash in the pan, and people would kind of, like, move on. But, like, they're still in the news, and people are still talking about them. So, yay for Raspberry Pi. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Did you see the, like, uh, Intel came out with some really cheap, uh, like, single board computer thing, right? So I don't know really that? cheap is true, but I saw they came out with, yeah, like a Pentium processor that's like Arduino compatible. Um, yeah, that's but right. People kind of passed over it because it's kind of not the point. Um, like it didn't make a lot of sense for people to do that. But 
the space is heating up. Like more and more people are making Arduino compatible boards, and uh, the Arduino itself uses a, a basic microprocessor, which is only eight bit computer and not that fast. Um, but there now there's ones with like 32 bit computers running, you know, significantly faster, where you can do you know a lot more processing on them versus just like I'm gonna blink some LEDs. <laughs> yeah, right. No, the Arduinos can do a lot more than that, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but no, no, definitely nothing like a Raspberry Pi or like this Intel chip where you could do some serious like image processing or signal processing. Yep. So if you were going to do image processing and you created a startup to do that, you might be doomed. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So my article is pretty cool. The title is Why is the world's Why the world's best photo startup is going out of business? Went went out of business. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's called the government. No, so so I think that it was <laughs> this article is like phenomenally interesting. Um, it's on this uh, app-based um, company called Everpix, and the idea here is they would take your photos, um, you know, upload them to their cloud, and then run whatever sort of image processing, classification, etc., to categorize your photos, and so then give you sort of a search engine for your photos. So you can say, you know. Um, Eiffel Tower and it would just show you photos that you might have taken over several years over several trips to Paris um, of the Eiffel Tower so um, so it seems like a cool idea and actually was a good idea they had a small but very loyal fan base or I guess customer base that were paying customers so you know they were they did have revenue um, and you know the the too long don't read uh, summary is that they basically went out of business. So for two reasons, one is they didn't try to grow their product. So they spent a lot of time focusing on the details and, um, you know, going through feedback from customers, fixing bugs. <clears throat> and they felt like, you know, the path forward was through, you know, pleasing their current customers as, as much as possible, which, you know, is very noble. And, and I, you know, I can totally empathize with that. Um, but meanwhile, you know, Instagram and Snapchat and these other major blockbuster, you know, photo based apps spend more of their time growing the user base, you know, log in with Facebook, get your friends to sign in, you know, more storage space. If you get your friends to sign in, uh, they made the app free, uh, I'm talking about their competitors. And so, uh, they kind of left this company in the dust. The other interesting thing is this was a startup, a few guys who were living in San Francisco and they paid themselves each $200,000 a year cash salaries. And, uh, this raised a huge stink, you know, both in the article and in the, in the comments, there's a really interesting discussion going back and forth, but it really makes you think, you know, if you have, I mean, this startup, you know, based on, you know, what I read in the article, they would have failed anyways. So it's like at least they were able to make a decent salary. <laughs> but then on the flip side of it, or I guess a great salary, I should say. But on the flip side of it, you know, a lot of people are saying, look, you took, you got $8 million in funding and you basically took most of it and kept it. Like the investors should never invest in any company that you guys make. And they're just really upset, you know. And so I thought that that whole dynamic was actually really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I never had heard of this before, this article, but the, this uh, this startup ever picks. But um, yeah, I mean, I thought that was interesting too. The like when I was skimming the article the first time I saw it, and I saw the salary costs were like so huge, and I was like, not just like theirs, but like in general, they were showing like how much they had spent on salaries, and I was like, wow, that's like really high. <laughs> yeah. And and those were saying like, oh, we're paying ourselves like the equivalent, you know, of other jobs. But that's kind of one of the things I've always heard about startups saying is like you don't take an equivalent salary you get a lot less salary because you're essentially donating some portion of your salary to the company in hopes that like it, or you're investing it right so like instead of taking the money out now you're leaving that money for the company to have more runway to get to the time when it makes tons of money and then your investment of shares and percentage ownership of the company pays out that much more yeah exactly i mean <clears throat> you know, it's true that they had this growth um, issue where they were, you know, charging customers and it was hard to get new customers. But, you know, if they had paid themselves like 50000 a year instead of 200000 a year, then maybe they'd have another year or two to sort that out. But instead, they're just like, 
you know, they're dead now. So uh, I think you have the next news article. So yeah, 3D printers at the Consumer Electronics Show. I, I should oh, have is looked that up what, what that is? I always CES just, stands for. Yeah, I never, I never actually looked it up. <laughs> okay, I think it's Consumer Electronics Show. Um, so I, I'm not super big into consumer electronics, I guess, like some people are or whatever, like the latest phones and the latest uh, gadgets. Um, but I, I, it's somewhat interesting. And uh, I am interested in 3D printers. And there was a lot of news about 3D printers at this year's CES. And... Um, uh, you know, I was I was trying to read read through what people were saying, and it's still like I guess a relatively young or new industry about what's going to happen with three D printers, um, and it appeals to me because of a lot of hardware, a lot of software, and you get to make cool things that you hold in the end. Um, yeah, definitely. But, but you know, um, there's still like a lot of questions around my mind. Like I see, see like a lot of people who think that they will be able to have a lot of use out of three D printers without doing any CAD work, um, like no designing their own things in three D programs and maybe that's like 3d programs need to become much easier to use um or like this year there was a lot of scanners coming out like you could scan an everyday object like in your house like oh i like this mug i'm gonna scan this mug and then i'll have a 3d model of it um so oh, maybe nice. that's one avenue but well, um, they also have the thingiverse right at least the thingomatic has the thingiverse and it's yeah like so a i think huge you get- warehouse of 3d objects like i've done that before just printed other people's objects but how far does that get you? Like if you had bought like your own 3D printer in your house and you didn't know any like programming, any, you know, didn't want to do any CAD work, 3D work, like how, would it, you that you'd justify the price like of $1,000 to only be able to print stuff that's on Thingiverse? Um, I don't know. I mean, so the thing is like the, only if the printing itself was an activity. Like if I would get my son when he's older and the two of us would, find crazy things on the internet like on thingiverse like dinosaurs or whatever and print them out uh but yeah you're right a thousand dollars i mean i'm hoping that by then the price will be more like you know three hundred dollars or something yeah so they have three hundred dollar ones now but they tend to involve more tinkering uh, oh bummer so i think yeah maybe maybe in another few years it will be i just like i just wonder like what is and um Several of the articles talked about this, and the one that'll be in the show notes was uh, more lengthy than most, but the, you need, still need the killer app. Like, what is the thing that you want to get a 3D printer to, like, you would do it, get one just to do that. Um, and we haven't really found that yet. And maybe once we do, it'll be like, oh, of course, like, this is awesome. Um, but for now, I, I'm still interested because, like, I like electronics and tinkering, and I'm not afraid to do 3D drawing. But um, I like the whole it's ready for the masses or it's going prime time or it's a consumer device still eludes me. Like, I'm not sure that maybe, that makes any maybe sense. This, maybe the 3D printer becomes like a way for you to customize, you know, something where like, you know, like you'd go to Best Buy and you would buy like uh, a toaster, let's say, but it would just give you like the inside of the toaster And then you could go to Thingiverse and the toaster manufacturing company has given you like a hundred different shells for the toaster, like one that looks like an Angry Bird or whatever. And you could just print with Oh, Angry Bird toaster. Yes. What I've always (laughs) wanted. Actually, you know, I think 3D printing something uh, like a toaster is probably supremely dangerous. Well, and a bad idea because it's plastic. It'll melt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. But you know what I mean. I mean, you get where I'm going yeah, with yeah. this. But, but I mean, even in that case, like, I agree. Like, I think 3D printing, rapid prototyping has, like, a use in industry and among engineers and, like, for rapid prototyping, right? Or, like, at a store, like, the Best Buy, you would go buy the – they would have a kit of toaster oven innards. But instead of stocking 300 different styles of toaster oven, they would just stock one or two different insides, and then they would 3D print whichever one you chose, yeah, and exactly. Hand it to you, right, but that doesn't still explain like why I would need one at home, unless I was gonna like change toaster shells every couple of months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know maybe that's maybe that's where it goes. Like for example, you know, uh, you don't really need a paint mixer at home, but you know I'm really happy when you know I go to Lowe's and they have one. But paint mixers aren't all talked about at CES and people saying, "Oh, this is the wave of the future." <laughs> well, maybe they were. Maybe they were at CES 1932. 
okay. Anyways, no, the 3D printers I, I are mean, cool. I guess my point is maybe it's it's not you know the the end goal really isn't your home you know like it's it's just for like right now it's mainly for geeks and geeks like doing things themselves but you know maybe the end goal is 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 you know to put it in a best buy like you were saying no sure no i mean to me it's extremely interesting but i also like making my own furniture and building circuits and so i mean like it makes sense to me for me i just like i guess i feel like i'm atypical in that respect that most other people aren't like that where they don't want to do that kind of stuff so we'll see I, but yeah. if you, you, you or if you're interested in 3d printers you should check out some of the cool stuff that was shown off at ces yeah definitely yeah 3d printers are actually super really fun and, and learning like uh i use blender but whether you use blender or uh was it solid there's one called solid some solid or scad solid cad okay regardless SCAD. of which one you use they're all uh they're all pretty cool and you can make some really fun stuff yep all right okay so i got a this pretty pretty cool article it's top 25 oddball interview questions and uh it's a good lead into you know our nice little segue you know mid mid show topic that we're gonna keep hidden for suspense reasons but uh but yeah, so this website, uh, you know, blog post from Glassdoor. So for people who don't know, Glassdoor is a website that discusses, um, well, the way it works is you um, can look around in Glassdoor and they'll give you like superficial information on different jobs, different companies, salary, expectation, things like that. But then after you get a certain, um, you know, way through the site, they say, oh, hey, you know, you have to give a little to take a little more. And so they uh, have you log in through like their account or Facebook, et cetera, and put in some anonymous statistics about your job, which, you know, they use to sort of, you know, keep the whole thing running. Um, but now they've, you know, they've become pretty popular among, you know, job seekers or career enthusiasts, I guess. And so they um, have spun off this blog. And on this blog, they do a, a variety of different things. Every year they have the top companies to work for the craziest uh you know work environment etc and this is a top 25 oddball questions and it's um you know a lot of i've seen a lot of you know sites like this and most of them focus on questions that they ask like project managers on the grounds that you need to be able to sort of think critically and think mathematically so you see a lot of these like this one in particular says how many cows are in canada how many quarters would you need need to reach the height of the Empire State Building? Um, you know, I've heard like how many. So those are I don't see those are oddball an airplanes stuff like that. Those are all the same same type of question. Or how much extra gasoline would the United States consume if there was a law passed that all headlights had to be on all the time on cars when they were driving? Right, right, and most of the time, what it comes down to is you have this like very complex dynamical system and you just need to start with like trying to simplify it as much as you can and you know just like for example the ping pong question you start by thinking you know how many ping pong balls can you fit in like a one meter cube right? yeah like basically it's just all about estimation but it's also proves on some of them you need to know a little bit more like for instance the one i said like headlights being on like that there's an inefficiency in powering a generator to have the headlight on that causes you to use more gas or whatever. In addition to estimating how many cars are in the U.S. and how much do they drive and how much gas do they consume. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So but, yeah, but it's pretty I, cool. But you should be ready to answer those. Like if uh, like that's a really common style of question to estimate something really big that there's no way you can actually know the answer to. I don't think that's oddball. Like, I think you should really know that if you're going to do any sort of engineering interview. Yeah, that yeah, definitely don't uh, just say like a hundred <laughs> or something like that. You know, I mean, what they want to know, and we'll talk about this more as uh, we go on. But but uh, what, what they really want to know are just like uh, the process and like your methodology. Yeah, so. I think that's it. Like uh, knowing you can take a seemingly impossible question and break it down piece by piece. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And each so, piece so kind of did you go sense. through these questions? Do you know? So, why is a tennis ball fuzzy? Um, why is a tennis? Uh, I'm assuming it has something to do with 
the way it bounces to keep it from like rotating or something? I actually thought it was to slow it down or something. Yeah, to keep it from going too fast. Oh, is that um, so, the real To like level the playing know? board. No, I don't know. There's actually not answers on these. <laughs> but there's do, they're oddball questions. <laughs> do you believe in Bigfoot? Do you believe in Bigfoot? No, that's one of these. Okay, we, we can oh, stop. Ridiculous. We can stop. So you that's should go mo- through these. That's Moby Ridiculous. Um, so, so, so on interviewing, have, what are some... What's that? Oh, on interviewing. So what are some like good tips for people like if they're going to yeah. interview? So, so this is sort of deviating from the normal show. Yeah, we're definitely going to get to Unix commands, but uh, as you might expect, you know, that's not a, an entire language, although maybe it should be. But, uh, you know, we wanted to add a little bit of uh, spice, a little bit of interesting uh, uh, content. And uh, so we decided to think, you know, what does it take to really ace an interview, right? Now, of course, you have to know, um, you know, you have to know what you're talking about. You can't have a degree in computer science and then try to ace an interview for the legal team, right? I mean, it's just not going to happen. But, you know, with that said, there are, um, there's a, there's, there's a whole process to interviewing and to being interviewed. And, um, you know, the reality is that Sadly enough, there's some people who fail at that process, despite the fact that they're extremely qualified, and it works the other way as well. And so understanding the interview process is a big step towards, you know, either, you know, changing careers or to interviewing other people for for roles within your company. Or graduating from college and trying to get your first job. Yeah, 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 definitely. There's no doubt. And we'll mostly be talking about We'll go from general to specific, but like in the beginning, it'll be applicable to everything. But then further along, we'll start talking specifically if you have what's called a technical interview, which is an interview where they're going to ask you to solve problems or, you know, do programming in the interview, which not every interview is that way. And if possible, you should try to find out in advance if it will be a technical interview or not. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good point. It's kind of sad, but I considered college as a career. (laughs) <laughs> like I, when I was thinking of my head switching careers, I guess it's because I was in college for so long that it, oh, okay. <laughs> it like, it's pretty bad. Anyways, so um, you want to go first? Sure. So, I mean, like the first and maybe this is like, like I said, they're general and therefore probably more obvious in the beginning. But you should read up about the company you're interviewing with. I mean, it's kind of like bad, but I've done interviews where the person comes in as kind of like, so what do you, what do you guys do? And they don't mean like what kind of work specifically do I do? Because I've already said that. They're like just asking like in general, what does the company do? Or like <laughs> yeah. what products they make? Um, and it's like, yeah, okay, that's like, you didn't look us up on the internet. Uh, you know, like this is not good. Um, so definitely read up and know about, you know, like what are the most famous products they do or the things in the news. And specifically, like if it's a big company, it's good to find out like, at that branch, what do they work on? So like if it, your company has like, you know, makes furniture and in one city they make couches and in one city they make desks, you know, if you can find that out, like that's also more helpful because then if you're interviewing in the city where they make desks, you're probably talking to people who work on making desks. And then, you know, you can ask specifically about that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, um, so Patrick and I have uh, been interviewees several times. Um, we've interviewed a lot of people. Um, probably between the two of us, we've interviewed over 150 people, just estimating. So, um, and one of the big things is, you know, there's some people who are there, um, but they don't really want the job or, you know, they find out they don't want the job by the time they get to your interview if they've had other prior interviews the same day. And so... Um, as an interviewer, just because of the statistics, it's very easy to sort of lump someone into the pool of people where you just feel like this, like they're just not interested, right? Because there are a lot of people who aren't interested, um, but are interviewing for other reasons or who knows, right? So um, yeah, you definitely, uh, as an interviewee, you want to understand the company and be enthusiastic. And I mean, the reality is if you don't understand what that company does, then uh, like how can you really want to work there? <laughs> it doesn't really add up. But yet yeah. you find tons of people who uh, who are in that category. So that's definitely yeah. the area where you want to yeah. do your homework. Um, so another one is 
<clears throat> you ha- uh, it's really important to be confident and not to be intimidated. So, or at least to act when confident. You're doing, yeah, yeah, especially when you're doing a technical interview, uh, just kind of keep telling yourself or just remember, uh, meditate on this, that, you know, the interviewer, um, you know, he might have asked that same question to, say, 50 other people, right? Or if he hasn't, he's preparing to ask that question to another 20 or 30 people, right? So he's going to be an expert on that question. And he might have seen just about everything that people have thrown at, 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 at a certain question. Like the guy who asks the, how many ping pong balls can you, f- you know, does it take to fill up a 747, right? Like he's probably heard a hundred different answers. And so, you know, nothing is really going to phase him. And he's always, the interviewer is always going to seem like one step ahead of you because they are one step ahead of you. They're in fact, they're more than one step ahead of you, right? So don't let this intimidate you. Um, the reality is, you know, you can, uh, you know, go through a process and while it feels like you're kind of struggling, what you're really doing as interviewee is, is solving the problem and you're solving the problem under distress because there's a lot on the line and there's a lot of time pressure. And, uh, so that's not a bad thing. You know, I think that there's uh, a lot of people get, get way too nervous in an interview setting uh, as soon as, you know, they start saying things that are on the wrong track, you know, don't hesitate to throw things out there that are bad and then, you know, come back to a better place and to a better solution, you know, so um, that's my two cents on that. <laughs> and we're going to have to speed this up a little or this will be the whole episode. But um, yeah, I mean, the other <laughs> yeah, thing is point. like always try to answer what they're asking, but then try to finish it out, right? So say like, oh, okay, first here I'm describing you like how I'm gonna attempt to solve it. Then like, oh, here I'm writing code, okay. Now I'm done with my code. Don't be like, oh, okay, I'm finished. Say like, okay, now I'm gonna test my code. Now I'm gonna, you know, like try to evaluate if I've made any errors um, and really going through that whole process um, is useful as well. Um, and then, you know, make sure also like it's some people don't think about this, but you will almost always get asked at the end of your interview. Uh, do you have any questions? And like, it seems kind of silly and oh, this doesn't really matter. They're just asking me like to be friendly. You know, do I have any questions? But in reality, like uh, at least this is what I've always been told and it seems to work. People think positively about themselves. So if the interviewer is talking about themselves, they're thinking positive thoughts. So they'll think positive thoughts about the interview. And it sounds really like psychological or something. But if you think about it, it makes sense. So if you ask a question like, what's your favorite part of working here? Or, um, you know, what do you like most about, you know, being a software engineer at Intel or wherever it is, then the person's going to like say something that they're passionate about. And then that's what they're going to remember about your interview. And it seems really silly and maybe it doesn't matter. Um, And if you have actual real legitimate questions, you can of course feel free to ask those as well, but at least ask some question or questions. uh, Even if you've asked other interviewers the same question that day. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's another good point. And then uh, we'll, we'll try to, as Patrick said, speed this up, but basically Uh, You know, you often have many interviews, you know, within one day, like you'll have many uh, interviewers that are coming and going through uh, for a particular interview. Um, And they, uh, by design, they don't collaborate. So, you know, if you flub the first interview because the morning and you just just it just didn't work out. um, Don't let that ruin your whole day. Right. Go into the second interview with a blank slate because it is a blank slate. I mean, if. If the company like, uh, you know, has people sort of collaborate from from one, uh, you know, session to the next, then they're not going to end up with five sources of honest feedback. Right. So so most people don't do that. And so it's OK to flub an interview or like one st- one one uh, one part of an interview. So. Um, so let's get to maybe more of the specific like uh, technical parts of the interview. Um, one big part is to uh, do a lot of open source or at least open source your own work, especially, you know, if you're not in industry yet, if you're in uh, academia or if you're uh, just a student, uh, uh, you know, graduating from college, you know, take your uh, assignments and kind of polish them, maybe put some comments and whatnot and then open source them, right? Even just put them on GitHub just so you have an account and a presence. You know, I think that's that's a really good idea and it's sort of like, get you familiar with some of the tools that you'll be using when you go to industry. Definitely. 
it's also important to even if you are fresh out of college or you've been out of college for a, a little bit longer um, to go through and like kind of from scratch go through the common data structures and algorithms that that you're likely to be asked about and the important thing here is from scratch like it sounds kind of silly but like without looking it up without doing it or looking it up once and then you know trying to implement it because there's one thing to like read about something and say like oh okay now i know you know about binary tree traversal and it's another to actually sit down and write the code for it and if you're in a coding interview you're going to have to write the code for it and it's best if you've written the code for it recently <laughs> um, and so it's a little easier to do so things like binary trees and tree traversals um, sorting you need to know at least you know one in login algorithm that you can do from scratch yep. um, the graph algorithms, recursion, dynamic programming. And then another big one in college, it's not typically stressed, but if you go to any sort of uh, large scale internet company, knowing about hashing and hash maps, like a lot. Um, almost every question uh, at a internet based company seems like it could have a solution that uses a hash map. Um, yeah, you're and- absolutely right. You're absolutely right. There's just, have you heard of locality sensitive hashing? I mean, no, but the words in English make sense to me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll have to talk about it some other time. But that that is like the topic du jour. It seems like everybody is um, like that seems to be like the internet, the interview question of the week or something on everyone's calendar. Oh, interesting. Um, interesting. But but yeah, but Patrick's absolutely right. I mean, you want to understand the fundamentals and uh, and yeah, it doesn't hurt to code them up. I mean, you think about it. Um, you see a lot of people like practicing martial arts like Kung Fu or Taekwondo or whatever and they do the same kick over and over again every day and a lot of that is kind of muscle memory it's like supposed to be instinctive and uh, so there's a number of competition sites like uh, Top Coder, Kaggle, Project Euler and you know if you if you go to these sites and you do a lot of their practice problems or compete in some of their um, you know student or, 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 or uh, professional competitions then uh, you know you will build that sort of muscle memory for your brain, and you will be able to sort of instinctively, uh, you know, you won't just, you know, someone won't just tell you the uh, some question. And you'll say three. <laughs> you know, it doesn't work like that. But you'll instinctively jump to a certain set of tools that will, you know, at least get you in the right direction. Yep, and and it is worth noting too. Like, even if you do programming day to day, and like it's arbitrary as it seems to do these silly questions. That is what these companies have chosen to do to screen people. And so you either got to kind of sign up to do it or just decide you're not going to work at one of those companies. Um, So like, you know, in my day to day job, I don't ever implement a binary tree from scratch. But if I know I'm interviewing at a company that asks these kind of questions, I should study that or decide that I'm just not going to bother um, because it's also, I've heard stories, uh, and we're moving into maybe the section where we talk about some bad stories, but I've heard stories before of people saying, like, I, I know how to do that, but I'm not going to do it for you. That basically, like, that's so elementary, like, it's a waste of time. Like, let's talk about other things. Um, <laughs> and, I bet that, okay. Yeah, so that doesn't work out that well. So, like, yeah. <laughs> you've got to be prepared to, like, it sounds bad, but, like, play the game that the interviewer wants you to play. Um even if you think you're above that. um. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, the reality is, is it it doesn't matter whether you're 25 or 52. Uh, You know, if you go to a technical interview, you're going to have to know binary trees, hash maps, sorting, et cetera. Yeah, and the interviewer knows there's a tool that does that already. Yeah, I mean, they know that as well, but like, that's not the point. Yeah, yeah, like the right answer isn't, oh, I'll use the binary tree code off the internet. (laughs) It's not going to work. Yeah. So, um, so you, uh, you want to cover best and worst? Yeah. So, I, well, best moment. I don't know if I have a best moment other than like ever not completely flunking out at someone's question. But um, my worst you don't moment have is a, what about a best interviewer moment? Like, did you have a moment where you interviewed somebody no. and it was really profound or anything? Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> But I do have a worst one. I was in an interview where I was going to have several interviews that day, I think like four or five. And it was like the first or second one. And um, this person asked me like a really open-ended question, um, like one of these kind of like estimation style questions. And I was like really going very in depth on it, like kind of, you know, exploring all the possibilities and waiting for them to guide me into like 
okay, that yeah, that's good enough. Or like, okay, let's get to a final answer. You know, like kind of seeing like where, how much detail they wanted me to get into. Um, and then uh, kind of by the end of it, they said, you know, I, I don't really think you have any technical ability whatsoever. Um, oh. And it was just like, oh, what? Like I was, and, but you can't explain, right? Like I was what like. What can you even say after that? So then I was kind of like, well, you know, I was just like waiting for you to tell me like when you wanted me to start you know coding or when you were thought i had given enough detail and they're like no i think you're just trying to dodge having to do any coding and i was just like oh oh um, my gosh <laughs> okay oh that's gut-wrenching so was it was in the beginning or the end of the day that was like the second interview out of like oh five, so. no so you still have to face the you know most majority of the day after that yeah but you gotta kind of like jason said shake it off because like just because that guy was that way doesn't mean other people will be um and if i go through with a bad attitude like it's just gonna everybody else is just gonna assume that i'm that's me normally yeah yeah definitely so i actually don't have a best moment either i think it's actually pretty hard to have a best moment interview right so uh, i got offered i'll talk about my uh worst interview interviewee moments um so as an interviewee it's similar to patrick you know i did like a lot of you know computer science theory and so um i had this one um stage of an interview where somebody was asking just kind of very specific questions on um like this certain type of architecture that i just never been exposed to it's like i never took a class on like networking or 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 anything like that so these are kind of like very specific networking questions and uh it was just really it's just really hard because i I kept like saying variety of things and there's sometimes when the person was trying to guide me in one direction, but like by guiding me, they were saying things that like opened up holes in the original problem. So I was like, Oh, well now there's this hole in this problem. So I could just do it this way. And they're like, okay, yeah. But what if you couldn't do it that way? And it's like, I just knew that they wanted me to say something, but I didn't know what it was, what that they wanted me to say. And I just felt so helpless. But, um, but like Patrick said, you know, you just have to shake that one off. It actually went pretty bad. The person about halfway through the interview started going on, like opened up their computer and started like chatting. Like, I don't know, like <laughs> it's hard to say if someone's taking notes or chatting, but I'm pretty sure this person was just like chatting to other people. Did I get a joke like, interviewer? To talk to me. A joke interviewee? Are you guys testing oh, me? It was so bad. But uh, then my worst interviewer moment, I guess I have, I have two, one really short. I was a phone interview and the person like pretty quickly into the interview. It's not like I had been kind of like badgering this person, but like, you know, like, like relatively quickly in the interview, you started crying. And I think it's just like the oh pressure no. was just too much that they were putting on themselves. And they just, that's just sad. Crying and it, was, it was just really, it was just super awkward. And then I'm only laughing because I'm, I'm like remembering just how awkward it was. And, uh, the other one, it was an in-person interview, and it was the same scenario. The person was just extremely nervous, and um, we were on a whiteboard, and the person had these Expo markers, and they were furiously writing, but they were left-handed. And so oh, no. as they were writing, they were kind of smudging the whiteboard with their hand, and then they were, like, profusely sweating because they were so nervous. So they kept rubbing their forehead, and then that ca- the, the, the Expo marker, like, you know migrated to their forehead and they had just like they looked like they had like kind of like these like native american tribal tattoos like all over their face (laughs) but it was all these different color exo markers and uh, uh, you didn't say anything i i I was like hey you know after the first problem i was like let's go get a get something to drink so we went and got a drink we came back it was like he got a soda and he was kind of like his hand was shaking so he's shaking the soda so no he no uh, like he turned around he didn't even have a chance to open the soda he turned around and the soda flew out of his sweaty hand and hit the wall and then exploded (laughs) and both of us and the whiteboard got like showered in like very foamy coca-cola and it was disgusting (laughs) that's not funny that's like just depressing (laughs) the worst interview i've ever given in my life and i actually I probably gave a little too much detail, and if, if you're listening or if you're friends, you know, I apologize. Um, and, you know, I still thought it was hilarious, um, no hard feelings, but but that was just, <laughs> was just so bad. Oh. oh man. Okay. 
<laughs> Time for uh, book of the show. Book of the show. So uh, my book is actually a series of comic books called Locky and Key. And I thought it was very well done, basically. Um, the thing that I thought was really cool about it is, you know, without giving too much away, um, there's this house full of keys. And each key, it's almost kind of like the uh, Twilight Zone, where each key kind of like bends the world in a way that's not, you know, generally bent. You know, and it just each key causes something crazy, some kind of crazy power or whatnot. Um, the book is a little too, like, generic. You know, like, like I, they gave themselves too much freedom. It's sort of like you have any key, and then, uh, without spoiling too much, the 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 antagonist ends up being just also kind of generic. But the the creativity is absolutely astounding, and the kind of crazy combinations of keys and all the things they do with them. I thought it was a really awesome series, and I highly recommend it. Nice. So it's a like comic book or a. Yeah, it's graphic you know, like novel? 20 or 30 issues. Okay. But, uh, you know, I don't really like, you know, like Spider-Man, Superman, any of that. But I do uh, really like kind of reading comics. It's kind of light. And, you know, usually I really like the artwork and everything. But, uh, um, but you know, this is like uh, uh, more like kind of s- not serious comic, but it's, it's, uh, it's not one of these like superhero uh, kind of like crazy fantasy comics. It's nice. meant to be. So it's a, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a, I guess, a horror comic. So. Oh, horror. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I chose <laughs> this book before I knew what you were picking, but it also has Locke in it, um, oh, with L O C K E. But this is the Lies of Locke Lamora, um, and this is a, a fictional book by Scott Lynch that I just finished. Well, actually, listening to, but I'll call it reading. Um, and it is pretty good. So it's a like crime thriller, kind of like ocean, think like Ocean's Thirteen, like a heist. And okay. um, but it's set in like a fantasy world. So it's this kind of really interesting world where they don't get into as much as it as like most science fiction would. Um, the details of like how this world came to be and kind of the rules of the world. Um, but they do. The author does a good job of setting up like an interesting environment for this thing to take place in. And I believe it's going to turn into a trilogy. I think the second book is already out and maybe the third is in the works as well. I sh- I'll have to look into it, but it, Oh, so if, it's pretty new then, but it, fi- yeah, but I, fi- uh, it's probably like three or four years old. I'd have to look, I don't really know. Um, but I just read it and I, I really enjoyed it. And it's not like some trilogies end where like, it's just the trilogy is just really one long book. Um, but this seems to have, you know, a, it, it, it like you could just read one book and be happy. Gotcha. Cool. So. Cool. Yeah, I'll check this out. So, wait, what's the theme again? Is it like futuristic or no? So it's it's like a fantasy world. So it, it's not really futuristic. Um, and there's like a little bit of magic. Um, I, I don't really know. It's not like medieval. How how would I call it? I don't even know like the age. Maybe like a little like steampunk. Oh, okay. Okay. But not like with like balloons, steam boats, or anything. <laughs> okay. Cool. So oh, yeah, yeah maybe out. like Lies 18th century, Lamar. maybe like 18th century, but like in a fantasy world. Now I'm trying to remember oh, gotcha, if there was any gotcha. technology in the book that would have placed it in a specific time. So I, I love I seeing know. some of these like uh, like futuristic, but the art styles from the past. Like there, there was this uh, artist that did pinup art, like uh, these are kind of like 1920s, 1930s, like kind of very pastel, very flat colors. Um, but then like the cars would be flying cars or like the, the, the technology would be like something outlandish. Right. And, uh, I always thought those contrasts was pretty cool. Nice. Nice. All right. So time for tool of the show. Tool of the show. My tool of the show is Duolingo. So long story short, I, uh, used to be pretty much fluent in Italian. I lived there for a while lived in Italy for a while, um, but uh, uh, I've since lost almost all of my fluency, uh, literally all my fluency, and so I wanted to build it back, and you know, I have <coughs> I have Brady, and I want to sort of teach him Italian and all of that, so uh, I picked up this app. It's really cool. It sort of gamifies learning a language, and uh, I feel like it does a really good job. I mean, my opinions, I feel like I can't really give it a fair um, 
you know, assessment because I already know Italian. So, so I'm kind of, you know, breezing through it. But I, but I really feel like uh, if you had no idea um, about the language, maybe I'll try Chinese or something next. Maybe but, I'll uh, try learning you know, Italian and I'll tell you. <laughs> it, it, it walks you through it at like such a fundamental level that uh, that that you could that you could uh, you could pick up any language with it. So you can get back your fluency. I'll try this out and try to become fluent and try to learn Italian to become fluent, and then you can tell me how good I did. All right, sounds good. One thing that's particularly cool about it is, uh, although I found out later, like only through using the app, that it's not it's not that accurate. Like it gives you oh. a lot of leverage. But it um, has this thing where you speak in the language to the microphone, and it evaluates your accent. I thought that was pretty cool. No, but then you told me it wasn't accurate, so now I don't think it's cool. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I don't know. Either I have a really good fake Italian accent, or uh, it's just giving me way too much credit. <laughs> play, play some, like, of the Mario soundtrack or something, like Mario speaking and Super Mario Brothers or whatever one of the games he actually talks in. And see what it gives him. <laughs> yeah. It's a me, Mario, 100%. <laughs> All right. So so my tool is by a company called Autodesk. And it's 123D Design. And um, so if you've heard before, I think we even talked about SketchUp, which Jason was talking about CAD tools before and talking about using Blender. And SketchUp was something that a company had made and then Google bought and then I think they sold it to someone else now, but um, was like a free, you know, kind of more basic CAD tool. And so this one, two, three D design is in the same vein. And um, I picked it up because I've been trying to learn some 3D modeling and there's like, you know, all these recommendations and depending on what you want to do or, or what it's targeted to. It's so like Blender is, you know, good for like, you know, artistic stuff and you can use it for kind of precision mechanical drawings, but you know, maybe it's not the best. I don't really know. Um, but this one seems good. It's a uh, free, it's not open source though. Um, and it's called one, two, three D design. Um, so if you're interested in learning CAD and looking for something that seems simple yet still like, you know, quite powerful, then, um, you should check it out. So if I remember correctly, Autodesk made a uh, 3d studio max, and then I believe they also bought Maya. Is that correct? So yeah. The so they actually, this company is like, yeah, they have like a whole host of, yeah, like all the major types of uh, CAD software they do. I'm trying to click through to see all their apps now. But uh, um, yeah, I'm amazed that like this company with so much experience and like so much invested in, in paid um, apps would, would make a free one. But I'm, I'm assuming like the other ones, maybe this is like the gateway to get uh, yeah, people to buy I, I guess so yeah so they make ones. 3d studio max maya the this more professional one called inventor i guess autocad uh oh they yeah. make autocad too wow yeah so they make a lot of like these kinds of products and this one seems like it doesn't have a lot of crazy features um like a lot of the macros and things for doing like bill of material and tolerances and stuff i haven't seen in it which i know oh, some I of the see. other ones do um but it seems like it is in a similar vein to the more complicated product. So like if you got to the point where you outgrew this one, you could transfer your knowledge into one of their paid products, um, yeah, that makes which I sense. guess is the point, but also an advantage because then you don't have to relearn something because, uh, you know, like Blender, you couldn't do exactly what you needed in Blender and, you know, you have to relearn another tool, um, which I'm not yeah, picking exactly. on Blender. I don't really know. That may not be an issue with Blender. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've used Blender quite a bit, but, uh, you know, I, uh, <clears throat> I mainly used it for artistic things. So, yeah, I don't know how precise it is, per se. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So, on to, well, you're calling it Unix shells, and I called it Unix commands, but it's just general oh. Unix knowledge. Yeah, Unix, Unix knowledge. So, one thing I have to warn everybody by listening to this podcast, um, you know, after you listen to this podcast, look in the mirror, you might have a huge neck beard and not even know it. What? I don't know if my wife's going to approve of that. <laughs> no, I, my wife definitely wouldn't approve. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you need to know something about a very specific way a Unix command, you know, behaves, look for your closest neck beard. Um, and that man, we also that just lost all our female listeners. <laughs> that man or woman will definitely help you uh, uh, with their Unix 
fantastic knowledge. Um, we'll cover some of the common shells. Um, I've used a bunch of these, but to be honest, uh, only one of them I've really liked. So uh, maybe you had a different experience. Nope. But uh, <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so there's born shell, seashell, corn shell, Thompson shell. There's also TC shell, which is a derivative of seashell. And I've used all of them, and, and in my opinion, they all were terrible. <laughs> the only good shell, and fortunately, a lot of people agree with Patrick and I here, so it's the default on uh, you know almost any Unix computer nowadays, is Bash, Bash shell. So Actually, I've been wanting I, to try out, do you know anything about fish shell? I've never heard of fish shell. Uh, people on like Hacker News are always talking about this fish shell. So I keep is it F I S H? Yeah, I keep telling myself I need to check it out. But all right, I'll keep looking. Keep going. Uh, so I'm looking at Bash Shell. Bash Shell was a replacement for Born Shell, but uh, I couldn't. I can't find out if Bash is supposed to be an acronym or what. Um, regardless, um, <clears throat> so we broke. So basically, there's a number of sort of core commands that will really make your life much more productive as a someone who's a, like a programmer or has to mess with a lot of you know structured data now by structured data I don't mean like SQL or something like that I'm talking about you know like comma separated files space separated files if you want to write something to like a flat file structure and you want to do something kind of quick and dirty uh, the best thing is to just kind of write ASCII text to a file and then do some manipulation and so the Unix um, shell is actually extremely good at this. It has a lot of functionality people don't know about. So um, we'll start with some of the easy ones. So there's um, cat. Cat lets you, um, basically it takes the contents of a file and it writes it to standard out. Actually, we should probably explain what these are. So <laughs> any Unix shell has streams. So it has standard in, which is, you know, a stream of data flowing into a program. Now, by default, that stream comes from the keyboard. So, you know, you can run a program. It can say, what is your name? You know, you type in, you know, you could write a program like this. You type in your name, hit enter. Now, when you hit enter, the information flows through standard in to the program, which is kind of waiting for it. And then it says, hey, hello, Jason, or hello, Patrick, right? So standard in, now you can also, if you don't want to have to use the keyboard, you can cat a file, which will take a file and sort of dump it to the screen. But then you can use the pipe character and you can take things that would have been dumped to the screen and sort of pipe them or redirect them into another program. So instead of typing JSON, you could have a file that has you know JSON in it, cat that file, pipe it to your program, and now your program runs with JSON. So you know if you wanted a program that you know executed some for some some process on some data, but you didn't want to have to like put the file name in the program, and then you know, you make a change, now you have to rebuild the whole program, right? The program could just read information as if it was coming from the keyboard, and then you use Unix streams to sort of feed whatever file you want through the program. Um, <clears throat> so that's cat, and that's sort of redirecting. Um, there's also sed and awk, and now we're starting to get a little more complicated. Sed does um, a number of things, but the most common is find and replace. So again, you can have this stream of data that's coming through, say you're catting a file, so you're just dumping a file, but you only want the words Patrick from the file. So any line or, or, or another way of saying is, anytime you see the word Patrick, you want to replace it with Jason. Because, of course, you know, let's be honest. Who, who wouldn't hey, want to hey, replace hey, Patrick hey, with hey, Jason? Hey. <laughs> so, so you would use said, and then you do, I think it's like S slash Patrick slash Jason slash G. So there's a little bit, again, it's Unix, so it's going to have this crazy wizardry, and you'll have to look it up on the Internet. Don't worry, all of us have to. Um, except for the guy with the neck beard. He has it memorized. Um, but you'd use said to sort of do things like simple things like that. Um, awk lets you do even more complex things. Um, but together, they both sort of um, have a nice union. Like between the two of them, you can do a lot of cool text manipulation. 
So then you have diff and patch. And so this will take diff will say like if I have two files, so like I made a copy of a file and then a, a piece of code and then I made changes to it, diff will tell me what lines have changed between the two files. And patch lets me, instead of having to send someone a whole new file, just send them the delta that they can then patch into their file and reflect my new version of the file. So it captures the differences between two files versus diff is more for examining by eye. And the yeah, same thing. Definitely. So you can, and you, you can, can also, you can diff uh, entire directories um, and it'll diff like everything inside the directories. And uh, you can also uh, redirect diff to a file. So now you have this diff file. You can send that to somebody and then he can patch your diff file. And now he has the same changes you have for like a bunch of directories. Yeah, so then there's tar. Tar, actually, do you know what tar stands for? I have no idea. I'll Maybe look it up. It Keep going. Like terminal archive or something. Okay, so what's the difference between tar and gzip? Yeah, so, so gzip um, takes a single file and then shrinks the file by using some compression, right? Tar will take a group of files and it basically just concatenates them together, but it also stores a little bit of metadata so that it knows where one file ended and the other began. And so TAR stands files. for Tape Archive. Oh, Tape Archive. Ah, oh, I guess now it makes more sense as Terminal Archive, but, <laughs> but uh, it originated as Tape Archive. It's interesting. So you can actually use both of these together, right? So you can use TAR on a directory to, you know, collapse the whole directory into one huge file and then use gzip on that file to make the file a reasonable size and that's why if you're downloading especially things for unix you download these files that have the extension dot tar dot gzip and that's because that's exactly what they've done right they had a directory they tarred it and they gzipped it and then they put it on the internet so uh what's cron tab so this is for when you want to run a script or program on a regular schedule. So something every hour or something every so often. Yep, Did I get that's pretty yep. much. That's I, pretty yeah, much I don't. Cron I don't tab. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So like the uh, you know a bunch of programs on your computer, like you know the that like uh, check for updates and all that stuff. They all just. They're basically cron tabs, and you can actually, I think you can type cron tab, maybe it's cron tab dash H or so. One thing, oh, one thing we should mention, for all of these commands, if you type man, which is short for manual, man, space, and then the command, they give you like a whole dossier on how the command works and everything. So half the things we'll say are wrong because we we just look it up every time, <laughs> but... But uh, yeah, if you type cron tab by itself, I would think, it, or maybe the dash L, it gives you a list of all the um, um, programs that you have scheduled. So next is uh, <coughs> is BG jobs and kill. These kind of all work together. So BG says, An assassin's you know, take the command. Kit. What's that? An assassin's toolkit. <laughs> I, oh, <laughs> yeah, I was guessing right. what they're for. <laughs> BG is for back background <laughs> no. oh. yeah no yeah so it's, it basically it takes your program runs in the background so you can keep doing other things on the terminal and your program will just you know run in the in the background until it's finished um jobs gives you a list of all the times that you've done this um so all the bg um commands that haven't finished yet and kill lets you kill one of those so if you have one that's kind of going out of control um you just type kill and first type jobs, find out which number it is, and then uh, type kill uh, percent the number, and it will kill that job. So I never get the, the PS right, but PS lists the processes. Is that right? Yep. yep. PS, so you can get yeah, that's right. pro processes. I have no idea. I've never used the history command. Is that the same thing as pushing up in bash shell and or yeah, control so R and searching through your history? His, his, History just gives you a list of all the commands you've typed since you opened the shell. Uh, um, I've always just output my, it's like dot bash history uh, in my home directory. 
Oh yeah. So this is a this is a one word command that does exactly oh, that. That's useful. See, this is why I do this podcast so you can tell me things <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so that's history. So read link is a rare but extremely useful command. You type read link and then dash f and then the name of a file and it gives you the full path to the file. Um, now, if you do read link and then the file, it gives you like the full path based on where you are now, but where you are now can be a symbolic link to some other directory, right? So uh, we won't get into symbolic folders, it's kind of complicated, but um, you know, you do read link dash F and then some file. And remember all these commands work in Mac as well as Unix. So if you have a Mac desktop or laptop, if you have a Mac Pro, if you uh, roll that way, um, all these commands will work. So read link dash F the file, and it tells you like exactly on the disk where that file is. Um, so that always kind of comes in handy. Um, so actually so we talked about programming questions before, and sometimes it's really easy to solve programming questions using oh, sort and unique. Um, sort will just oh. sort the lines in a file, and unique will give you the unique occurrences it and also can give you counts. So if you have like right. unique and then it occurred this many times or just the number of distinct lines in a file. And so this can be useful. For instance, if you have like a log of all the IPs that have visited your website, you could unique them and then get just the number of unique IPs and know how many unique visitors you had in the log file, right? So this like could be a common programming question. You could solve this way, although they might want you to actually do it programmatically. There is a, pro uh, a file or a Unix command you could use to just do it. Yeah, I think if you walked into an interview and like somebody said, you know, as Patrick said, like, you know, give me a histogram of, you know, the frequencies of IP addresses. And instead of like, you know, busting out C++, you just, you just whipped out like a one liner and bash and did the whole thing. I think that'd be pretty cool. You get some props to that. Like Patrick said, you probably still have to do the problem again, but, uh, but that'd be, that'd be pretty interesting. Um, so the next ones are TR and TS. Um, actually, actually, that's that's a typo in my notes. I meant tr and tr dash s. <laughs> ah. So, so basically, tr. Um, let me make sure I get this right. I'm like totally flubbing this. Tr dash s um, is a basically okay. So tr dash s is a collapse command. So for example, let's say you have um, a file, but <coughs> this file is like maybe user generated content. And what you really want is to, you know, split the file based on spaces um, so that you can do a cut, which actually I'll cover cut as well. Um, <laughs> the list is getting longer. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, um, <coughs> so you, you know, but some of the columns have like, so you'll notice is if like, you look at say the output of PS, right? The output of PS has usually three columns, but then they use spaces so that all the columns kind of line up, which is great for looking at it. But if you want to write a program to analyze the output of PS, it'd be much better if there was just one space between the three columns, right? Then you wouldn't have to like write some code in C or C++ to like, you know, move that many spaces and all of that. So TR-S does exactly that. It looks for consecutive characters and then it collapses them. So like if you put in TR-S and then the letter E, you know, if you, if somebody uh, put the word C and it would turn into Sen. <laughs> it would just like collapse all the consecutive E's together. This is really useful because the next command is cut. And cut lets you pull individual columns out of a, you know, a Unix stream. So again, going back to the PS example, if I did a tr-s, so now I only have, you know, one space separating all the columns. Now I can do a cut, um, and then the space. You can actually represent a space with like a, you know, a single quote space single quote. Then what that will do is it will cut the stream, and then after that you do a dash f and then the number. So if I did, if I did cut space dash f one, it's going to pull the first column from that stream of information. So if I wanted, say, to kill every process that I started, 
I could do a <coughs> PS and then I could do a, you know, send that to cut. And then now I have just this list of process IDs that I could then, you know, go through and kill. Nice. And grep is like the de facto search tool. So if you have like a file and you want to look for something in that file, um, you can use grep and there's all sorts of parameters for it as far as like expressing what you're looking for and um, tweaking the output, like showing stuff before and after the line that contains what you're looking for um, and all that wonderful stuff. So grep is a really powerful command for searching for things in a single file or in multiple files. Yep. Yeah, if you want to do a whole directory, just do dash r and uh, put the name of a directory instead of a file, and it'll look in all the files for whatever you want it to search for. Mm. So then there's, last but not least, there's xargs. And uh, this is pretty cool. What this does is it takes some Unix stream, it looks for all the new lines, and then it splits that up. So each line of the stream is like kind of its own thing. And then it takes whatever program you put after the xargs and it executes that program on that string. So for example, let's say you did a grep-h-r on a directory and you looked for Patrick. So, this is, so dash h will tell grep, you know, return all of the file names that have the word Patrick in them. Then you could pipe that to xargs and then say xargs emacs and it'll open Emacs with all those files all ready to go so that you could change Patrick to Jason. So. <laughs> this is exhilarating, my friend. <laughs> Best podcast content ever. <laughs> oh, man. Just type this into your terminal and follow along with us. <laughs> yeah. So, uh,. So now we have, this is, this will be a little more interesting, some uh, rare but useful commands. We have a couple on here. Um, have you ever used this one? No, nope. uh, none of the remainder that you're going to talk about I've even ever heard of before. <laughs> okay. We'll go through these pretty quick. Um, expand turns tabs to spaces. So one thing everyone should know, if, if, if you leave the podcast with one bit of information, Know that the tab key is evil and should be abolished. And anyone who thinks the tab character should exist is a is a bad, bad, bad person. And so expand agrees with me. Expand takes any tabs and uh, deletes the tab and replaces it with spaces. So you can open a file, I can open a file, and mine won't look totally screwed up because my tab width is different. Um, FMT is short for format. And, you know, sometimes you might have, you know, you might have a lot of data. And, like, you might have some huge spreadsheet that you want to put into a terminal or something. And it just, like, it's like the line is 4,000 characters long, and it just looks ridiculous. And it just, like, half of the words get, or not half the words, but, you know, some of the words get cut off at the edge of the page because they wrap around. So FMT, you just pipe your, you know, whatever you're streaming to FMT and it just comes out looking pretty. So I like my output to be pretty. Yeah, pretty output is uh, guaranteed path to success. Even better than a successful interview is having pretty output. So then there's quirky commands. Uh, have you ever used these cal or banner? No, I've never heard of any of the ones I told you already. Are you on? Uh, you surpassed you on a Mac my now? knowledge. Yes. Type uh, type banner and then type some text. Okay, I feel like this is even more compelling. <laughs> a more compelling <laughs> podcast. <laughs> what? So, I don't really know how to explain this. So what is the say, point you of put this? Put in banner and then you put in some text, and uh, it just makes your text look ridiculous. <laughs> it just made it really, really big. <laughs> and repeat it yeah, over I and think over. It's like from way back in the day when people had like dot matrix printers or something, and the banner is like somehow useful for that. I don't know. It's bizarre. Okay, interesting. So it just takes the letter. So, so those of you who weren't watching my screen, if you type <laughs> banner and then test, it makes like ASCII art of the word test, basically. 
Yeah, and like it's just crazy that every Mac computer on Earth has this completely useless <laughs> program on it. Um, Cal is also pretty useless. It just gives you a calendar. Whoa, wait, that sounds good. I'm, oh, I'm sure this was. A, I'm sure this no, was useful, this is useful. You know, forty years ago. No, I didn't but know now this. It's just a relic. I'm constantly going into my email program and like using the calendar there. Oh, are you serious? Like, yeah. Is it actually useful? No, this seems good. If, <laughs> oh, and I can say how many months. Yeah. No, this is good. <laughs> I, I'm I'm like only like fifty percent sure you're not playing along. <laughs> no, no, no. This seems good to me. How do I make it up at more than one month? Okay. Anyways, I'll figure it out later. This seems awesome. Well, you know, uh, you'll be pretty pleased. There's also a date command. We didn't Wait, talk about what? that one. But what does this do? Oh, that's boring. But between my date and calendar, I have man, my command prompt set. already set up to show the date like this, though. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, this was uh, if this, this wasn't was the best episode, podcast kind ever, of a hodgepodge of things. It's been uh, it's been a pretty crazy uh, you know year. Uh, definitely a crazy start of the year, and uh, you know I think uh, you know now that we've sort of got our feet in the water, we'll definitely dive into a programming language next next episode. All right. Sounds good. Now that you've uh, won the lottery and you're a multimillionaire, you'll have more time to just sit on your. Uh, couch and study programming languages yeah that's right well sipping mai tais in hawaii but but yeah your couch is not in hawaii (laughs) nice yeah actually so uh um i did not even come close to winning the lottery oh but but i do if i did win the lottery i would be able to print the amount i won in ridiculous ascii art using the banner command yes (laughs) yes uh, all right well before we keep people up past their bedtimes listening to this long rambling podcast i think we'll call yeah, it to a have close a great, uh have a great uh you know start of the year um the start of the year has definitely been pretty exhilarating and exciting for for uh patrick and i and i hope you guys are having an equally interesting and fun time and uh you know keep uh keep checking out the books of the show we really appreciate it that um all those proceeds go to keeping the servers up and running you guys use terabytes of bandwidth, and uh, um, the books are what help to support all that bandwidth. So uh, we maybe, appreciate it. Maybe there isn't very many people actually out there listening to us. Maybe they're all just have like evil scripts running against us to download our podcast continuously in hopes that it will <laughs> run out or cause us to go bankrupt. <laughs> well, you know, if we got DDoSed, um, because you know we have the unique visitors. You know, if we got DDoSed by that many people, I would con- I would wear that as a badge of courage. Yes. No. Wait. No. Honor. No. That sounds like you're encouraging people to DDoS us. Please do not. <laughs> yeah. No. Our server can't take it. Really. I mean, they're mad enough. Mad enough as they're mad enough at us as it is. So they don't need. Uh, uh, they don't need to get DDoSed. <laughs> All right. Well, till next time. All right. Catch you guys later. The intro music is AXO by Binar Pilot. Programming Throwdown is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 2.0 license. You're free to share, copy, distribute, transmit the work, to remix, and adapt the work, but you must provide uh, attribution uh, to uh, Patrick and I and uh, share alike in kind.